Hello and welcome to News Click's show Mapping Fault Lines, where we look at major geopolitical issues across the world. Today we are going to be looking at a large continent that is Latin America, where a lot has been happening in recent months. We have seen elections, we have seen scandals, and we are specifically going to start with one country which is a very important country in the continent, that is Brazil, and its President Jair Bolsonaro, who has been in the centre of controversy ever since he assumed power. Now, Bolsonaro's situation has drastically weakened over the past few months, the COVID-19 pandemic really having an impact on the country. For Indians, there's another specific angle with the whole Covaxin scandal in the country and his situation is right now quite weak. So to talk about this, we have with us Prabir Purkaista. Prabir, so Bolsonaro right now looks a bit surrounded and besieged because there are scandals of all sorts. There's financial corruption, the health issue, his general, the way he's handled the COVID-19 pandemic as a whole. So how exactly do we see the crisis he's facing right now? You know, to put it very shortly, the very simple way, uh, Jair Bolsonaro is medically having hiccups right now, and so his government. So we see a really a stuttering Bolsonaro. The, the kind of support he had won initially, that has waned considerably. And he's increasingly getting isolated, even from his allies, those in the Congress, and the House of Chamber of Deputies who had supported him seem to be slowly deserting him. As you know, he's uh, got rid of a number of his health ministers. Yes. And whatever he has done has not gone down well because he initially claimed that COVID-19 was really something which was not worth bothering about. He also talked about how great he was that he didn't really have to worry about any of this. He has followed what I would call a Trumpian policy of complete disregard for the science of what was happening. And then talking in a way that made the pandemic seem as if it didn't really matter. And when it hit the Brazilian people, and as we saw, Brazil is one of the hardest hit. In fact, the numbers of death, uh, the second highest in the world. So given all of that, uh, his image has taken a beating. So that is one, and of course, recently, uh, as you talked about, the Covaxin issue, buying 20 million doses uh, from uh, Bharat Biotech and giving $15 per dose, which was the highest of all the vaccines, and the kind of uh, corruption issue that has been raised, people saying that there was a Singapore farm uh, which was supposed to get to a $45 million dollar uh, which is not mentioned in the contract. It was, or it seems to represent Bharat Biotech. It's not mentioned in the contract. It's an independent firm otherwise. And Singapore, as you know, is a tax haven. So was it some way to siphon enough money and get it back to other people's accounts in Brazil? We don't know. So those are the kind of issues that have come up. And particularly because the, peop the person concerned, who was in the health ministry, came and informed Bolsonaro about this. He said, yes, he's going to take action. Nothing really happened. Now, as you know, the both the House is moving on it. The Congress has set up, a, not Congress, Senate. the Senate has set up a committee to look into this. They have been having uh, meetings and they have taken uh, depositions from witnesses. The Supreme Court has asked for the Prosecutor General to start the proceedings. So all of this shows that Bolsonaro is quite on the back foot. Of course, there is the other issue, how Covaxin could have been exported from India, given that Bharat Biotech has failed to meet its own obligations. It's a different issue. And of course, the contract seems to be under suspension. Probably it will be cancelled. But this is only a small uh, issue in a whole range of issues which has plagued Bolsonaro. And with Lula having come out not only of prison but also been vindicated that the case against him was really something which was foisted by Judge Moro and that, that case having collapsed, Lula's popularity has gone up significantly. He is he's seen to be a much more credible candidate than Bolsonaro. So Bolsonaro's second term, if he runs against Lula, seems to be at the moment a very long shot for him. So Brazil moving away from the Bolsonaro path, which was the most right-wing of governments we have seen for a very long time in Brazil, who was openly extolling the military coup of the 60s, all the things that you can think about that's wrong with uh, Brazil's uh, right, right-wing, Bolsonaro really represented right. that. 
and his family's corruption, his son's corruption, all those things have been already there in the public eye. So if Brazil comes back to Lula, and Lula is now taking a relatively more social democratic left position than he ever did earlier, and it's very clear that his uh, views of in the United States has also sharpened much more because the U.S. was clearly behind what happened in uh, Brazil. Uh, both the Dilma Rousseff uh, uh, getting the Congress to remove her, the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff, and then what happened to Lula. So given all of that, uh, you can also see the U.S. concern. The CIA chief ran to uh, Brazil very recently to have a meeting looking at what is happening over there. So Brazil's shift to the left would be a very, very big uh, change in Latin America because Brazil is, let's face it, the most important country in, the, in that continent. And if Brazil takes a different position and he, it comes back not only to the Dilma Rousseff position, which as you know was a vacillating one, but to a more firm left position. Right. And that, I think, makes a huge difference to what's going to happen in Latin America. Because Latin America, from a particular position where we saw a Mercosur kind of alliance, we saw a Bolivarian alliance also within that, has had been uh, sort of defanged in very different ways mm -hmm. and had fallen prey to the U.S. machinations, both in terms of trade policies and in terms of foreign policy. So if Brazil comes back to this position, then the, the range of constitutional coups that the U.S. has been launch, launching over there, starting even with Brazil, and then we had the one in Bolivia. Right. Then we have, of course, the Ecuador is still successful from the U.S. point of view. But we have also seen that what they are now trying in Peru, for instance. But these have been not isolated instances. Right. This has been the American pattern. So I think Brazil, and if you remember, it started with Honduras. That was quite some time 2009, back, right. 2009. So if you take all of that together, Brazil's shift would be, in some sense, a very, very uh, major tectonic shift in Latin American politics. So I think that's what is at the moment something to watch for. Absolutely. And it's interesting you mentioned CIA Director William Burns' trip to Brazil because they seem, he and Bolsonaro seem to have discussed the region as a whole. And it's obvious why they're discussing the region because we've seen a, a shift in power, what you talked about in recent times in the continent itself. We've seen Argentina where Mauricio Macri was defeated by, uh, say, Alberto Fernandez. We've seen Peru and we have very interesting possibilities in Chile as well. So could you maybe take us through the region as well in that aspect? For our generation, Chile has been very important, was very important. The coup against President Diane Day, which was killed, and the right wing took over, military took over with Pinochet, massacred young people, activists, uh, imprisoned them in a uh, uh, stadium, you know, large numbers being put in prisons, and of course the whole litany of uh, abuse that took place over there. That's one part of it. But the second part of it was it was the first really neoliberal experiment. It was run directly by the Chicago uh, School of Economists. They, the power sector reforms, which later on was taken to UK and came to, came in fact to World Bank, to India and various other countries, started with the Pinochet Chile. And it was enshrined in the constitution itself that what the state will not do. And therefore, the whole defanging of the state, uh, taking the state out of a whole range of activities, which would be considered at best welfare or social democratic, not, not more than that. All of this was all of that was made into Martin Milton Friedman's very right wing uh, economic policies. The state will not have to, will not do anything. Will just protect the market, etc., etc., etc. And this also had its effect on the education system, for instance, that what the state could or couldn't do for supporting people's education, young people's education. And that was the actually the fuse uh, that was lit. The students coming into the streets, fighting it out, and the left emergence again among the students' movement, taking over small, smaller municipalities, even in Santiago. 
the, the major town of Chile where one third of its population is there. And they, the left emerged really out of the student movement and this kind of local politics, if you will, where the figures who now are important in Chilean politics have emerged. And the, uh, this May, the decision earlier, of course, was that they will go for a constitutional congress to dismantle the Pinochet regime's uh, structure. But what was important in this vote, which took place in May, is that the, the right could not even muster one third of seats. They are running the, they are still in the government. So they are the ruling part, ruling coalition at the moment. But if you see that the not having, not getting even one third of the seats means simply they're in no position to stop anything in regarding the constitution. So the constitutional changes probably will dismantle a whole range of Pinochet quote unquote reforms. So that is a very, very significant development in Chile. Argentina, you've already talked about that we have a left of center coalition that has come into uh, place. It also talked about, it's also pointed out this taking steps on uh, the, the, uh, the Argentina and supplying bullets, arms to uh, the coup uh, Bolivia. in Bolivia. So that is that, that all that has already come out. So already you see the shift that is taking place in Argentina. There is going to be elections in Chile by the end of the year. And if that shift also manifests itself in the presidential elections, followed by a constitution which is much more uh, social democratic, if you will, I think the fulcrum of politics in Latin America would shift decisively in the direction which it was, say, when Lula was the president of Brazil. You see, at that point of time, uh, Brazil led also the BRICS uh, alliance, and BRICS alliance and, of course, Russia and China. But the three countries, which are the so-called non-aligned countries, were India, South Africa, and Brazil. And Brazil was the international leader of that. So if Brazil also plays its role, of course, India also went to the right, it's still with the right. So that change probably will not take place here. But nevertheless, it does mean at least the Latin American pole would shift decisively towards the left. And with Argentina already having a change, uh, Chile in the throes of one. And next year, the Brazilian uh, elections are due. And if we also see Bolsonaro's or the right wing's defeat, I think then you are likely to see a decisive shift in Latin American politics. And if you do so, it has its implication for global politics as well. And of course, uh, at the same time, in the slightly towards the north, we have Venezuela and Cuba, which despite all US pressures have continued to remain firm and actually are able to provide a lot of both ideological support as well as inspiration for people in the continent. In this context, Prabir also finally wanted to quickly look at the position of the United States here because we saw the kind of policies Trump undertook, the kind of support he was giving to the right. Biden has not really, what, what really is, seems to be Biden's line on these issues, especially considering that on the one hand, the, U, the US global uh, say perspective is also looking at how to counter China. You know, the litmus test of Biden's policy vis-a-vis -vis Trump's is Cuba. And there you can see that the Trump policies are continu being continued. There's no change in that. I think Trump instituted a whole range of new sanctions right. on Cuba. Biden has not withdrawn any of it. And his response to the sporadic uh, protests that have taken place in Cuba, mainly because there is an economic discontent, there is a lot of problems that are there. Cuba had a major income coming in from, from tourism, which because of COVID-19 has not taken place. And uh, their, their sanctions have only worsened the conditions that they have. Given that, the, the way Biden has talked about the freedom-loving people of Cuba, without talking about the sanctions and also the fact that the United Nations the, uh, has again asked for sanctions being withdrawn. So all of that makes clear that Biden's policy when it comes to, comes to the crunch is not different from Trump's. Yes. We do not see any significant difference with respect to either Cuba or Venezuela, the two 
countries which really are the ones the U.S. Was, is trying to for quite some time to destabilize. Cuba, of course, long range of sanctions, but Venezuela, because they do feel that Venezuela is a very important player because it is oil. And therefore, if Venezuela can be brought back uh, with, you know, in the, in, the, in the ranks as Colombia is, then, of course, it makes a huge difference for, for what in Latin America. That is not happening. That, and that is also uh, it also shows that Biden has not changed any of those policies with respect to either Cuba or Venezuela. Bolivia has come back to the left. That is the good part of it. Whether the constitutional coups, will the William Burns, the CIA, and uh, President Biden continue with the same policies or not, that's something to be watched. At the moment, there are no signs either with respect to Venezuela and Cuba, if you take that as a weather vane, so to say, right. or what the Biden policies could be in difference to what Trump's policies are or were, I think the answer is at the moment we don't see any clear difference between the two. And effectively the policies are more in terms of continuity in rather than in terms of discontinuity. So I'm not very sure that they, while people thought of Trump as crude and aggressive, yes, he was aggressive. He also isolated himself from some of his allies, which Biden is trying to cover up in terms of the NATO alliance and European Union wooing the European powers. But in terms of actual policies on any of these counts, I don't think we see any, any, any difference at, at all, any difference at all. And the fact that William Burns rushed to uh, consult with uh, Bolsonaro and suggest might be that what he needs to do also shows that they are deeply concerned that this continent now may be slipping back and the focus on China may have also taken the eye off Latin America, which they be believe is something they should control. The good old Monroe Doctrine right. hasn't really gone away. Right. Thank you so much, Praveen, for talking to us. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click.